The midweek national lottery draws live at 5 to 10 here on BBC One after Nick Ross and Fiona Bruce ask for your help once again in Crime Watch UK. Welcome to Crime Watch live from Television Centre in West London. The fight against crime, this is your chance to help. These are the senior detectives on all the cases that we're going to feature here tonight. Uh, they've travelled to the studio from all across the UK. Some have journeyed further. These are FBI agents who've phoned in from Boston, Massachusetts. And if you solve their appeal, there's a million dollar bounty. Also coming up, the bogus social workers who take indecent photographs of children. Turn him around. The driver who died trying to stop a thief. Plus, we've got some great results, including how Crime Watch viewers helped catch a rapist. One of the things he said to me was, don't tell the police because Crime Watch doesn't work. And I think it's ironic that he's proved that it actually does work and works extremely well. First, one of those crimes that truly shocked people, and that was before two other terrible incidents were linked to it. It seems now that three young people have been attacked in all. One of them, Marsha McDonnell, died. The latest violence happened yesterday, about half a mile from where Marsha was killed, and again, it was after midnight. It's revealed new clues, and in a moment, we'll show you what they are. But first, the most tragic case. Marsha's friends take us through what happened the evening of her death three weeks ago. My dad took us into Kingston because we didn't want to get the bus, basically, because it was freezing cold. <laughs> so he just dropped us before the bridge and we all walked over. Well, we'd all arranged to um, go to the cinema and uh, see Catch Me If You Can. I wanted to see the film because I thought it looked good. Um, Lou and Marsha wanted to see the film because it had Leonardo DiCaprio in uniform in it. I don't fancy it. Why are you turning down? Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, I've got a boyfriend. Oh, I've got a boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> Marsha was such a big impact on everybody. And if I was ever going out with any of my friends, there was always Marsha coming out. She makes everyone laugh as well. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa! <laughs> <laughs> Look at that! It's like something my dad would wear. No, I think it is your dad. Oh, it, it is! is. Your dad. Dad. What are you it doing is. in the window? <laughs> I could never ever possibly have an argument with her. I don't see how anyone could have an argument with Marsh. I didn't think I'd find any that would actually go with the outfit. I think we got there about half an hour early to see the film. The film was at quarter past nine. So we literally just had time for one drink, so we weren't in there very long. It was my 21st birthday, so I was having a party and I wanted it to be a bit different, so I thought we'd have a fancy dress uniform party. And Marshall and Lee were desperately trying to come up with unusual ideas for what I could wear. Crazy ideas they're coming up with. What about dustmen? <laughs> We were a bit late for the film, so we just rushed up to the stairs to get our tickets and then just went straight in. Hands on your head. Oh, that's the new IBM Selectric. Put your hands on your head. Print type in five seconds. Shut up! Pop out the ball. Put your hands on your head. The film didn't finish till 10 to 12, and our bus was at 5 to 12, so we had to race out while the credits were coming on. We got the bus stop quite near where the station is. I don't know Kingston that well, so I just kind of followed them. <laughs> Our bus was due at 5 to 12. As soon as we got there, we pretty much, me and Tasha, got on the bus. It's all right, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. It wasn't anything special. Oh, oh Marsha, here's your bus. Oh, oh no, no, it's, no, it's ours. Oh, OK, we're well, fine. Oh, okay. Take right. care. Come on, we'll... Mm. I'll see you at your party, right. yeah? Before then, yeah. <laughs> OK, are you going to be all right? Yeah. 
Okay, okay. leave your mobile on. Give you a call, yeah. Okay, okay. bye. Right. See you later. Bye. 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 Marsha's bus is due every 15 minutes, so we knew she'd pretty much be getting on it in the next five minutes after we left. After a few minutes, Marsha caught the 111 bus at eight minutes past midnight. Her journey took her back over Kingston Bridge towards her home in Hampton. Marsha got off the bus in Percy Road at the stop after Hampton Station. She walked back down Percy Road and turned right into Priory Road where she lived. The time was approaching 20 past midnight, 20 minutes into Tuesday the 4th of February. Ambulance coming. You're gonna be fine. Just, just, just hang on. Yeah, put it on her shoulders. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Just, just hang on. If you can hear me, just hang on. There's an ambulance on its way. No, no, nothing. I tried talking to her, but nothing at all, no response. Marsha had massive head injuries. She was taken to Kingston Hospital, but died next day. She was 19. Tasha went ahead with her 21st party, because we were going to cancel it because of what had happened, but we know that Marsha would be the first person up there. <laughs> dancing about, so we just had the party and said a few words for her. Yeah, I lit some candles for her. I think, I really think she was there. I feel like she was. This is Detective Superintendent Alistair Jeffrey. Not just Marsha, but now two other people attacked in the same way, and you're sure they're linked. Why? Well, we're linking these crimes because there are certain similarities between them all. Uh, they're all in fairly close proximity. They're all during the hours of darkness. Uh, they all seem random and motiveless, and uh, the weapon used seems to be a blunt instrument in each occasion. Now, let me just tell you a little bit more about these other two attacks to put them in perspective. A 17-year-old girl was found seven weeks ago in Walpole Gardens in Strawberry Hill. It's about two and a half miles from where Marsha was found. At first, people thought she'd just fallen on the ice. It was very snowy at the time. But at the hospital, they discovered that she had injuries on the back of her head, uh, an injury probably caused by a blunt instrument. She was very seriously injured. The boy was hit here in Ormond Drive in Hampton. A man swung a heavy, a heavy object at him twice, but the teenager managed to dodge. Just like Marsha, he'd been on his way home after a night out with friends. He was coming back from Kingston on the N285 bus. He got off at Hampton Hill, walked along the Uxbridge Road and into Ormond Drive. And that's where he saw someone, and this hasn't been released until now, emerge from behind a wall 
and run towards him. It was a dwarf wall, so the guy must have been lying down, hiding behind it, which is pretty significant. What else new have you learned from this attack? Well, really, the most important thing that's come from this attack is for the first time we have some idea of what the attacker looks like. Uh, it's not a brilliant description, but we do know that he's fairly tall, probably between five and six foot. He's a fairly slight build. Um, and he had, did have distinctive clothing on at the time. He was wearing a, a white hooded top with the hood up, and over that was a uh, dark jacket also with the hood up, a fairly heavy jacket. So he had two hoods, so he'd really come out protected uh, against the, the night chill, and it was pretty cold then, of course. He did have two hoods up, yeah. Uh, OK, it's been suggested in one of the papers this morning that, that he had a hammer, that was the attack weapon. You don't know that for sure, do you? We don't know it was definitely a hammer. No, it was a blunt instrument of some type. Um, but this type of attack with a blunt instrument is very, very unusual. And it wouldn't surprise us if uh, this person has used that type of instrument in a, on another occasion, perhaps for a minor offence or in some other way. So that could be quite significant. Or hitting furniture, hitting an animal, somebody who's shown this sort of predilection for violence before like this. It could be anything like that. And given, as you say, that it's motiveless, it seems so irrational. Um, could this be something, somebody who's been in contact with mental health workers before? I mean, most people who are mentally ill don't get involved in any sort of crime, let alone this. But this seems so irrational. Maybe that's a possibility, a real one. Well, it is a possibility, and obviously we're appealing to anyone out there who may have treated or may be treating someone they think could have committed an offence like this to come forward. Now, I know some might think that would be a breach of confidentiality, but it's quite clear from the General Medical Council that in actual fact this is in the greater public interest. This is about saving someone's life, potentially. So if anyone has any information like that, please call in. Three attacks now. This is real serious danger to public, uh, to, to, public uh, to the lives of other people in the area. Let me come back to that in a moment, ask you about the friends of this person, anybody who's a family member, what would they have seen in his personality? What, what? Well, the first, the first attack was in early January, and it may be from that time that his behaviour, this person's behaviour has changed significantly. And anyone has seen a change in a friend or a family member uh, that could believe that that's significant, then please call in. Every bit of information is vital. These last two attacks were late on Monday nights, early into Tuesday morning. Anything significant in that? Well, really, the significance of that, I mean, the most recent attack was um, Monday night, as you say, into Tuesday this week. Um, that person would have got back home if he'd gone straight away at about 3.30 in the morning, potentially, if he's a local man, which we believe he may be. Now, we spend so much time on this programme telling people, look, serious crime isn't as, as widespread as often people think, but here in this area around Hampton, this is a real problem now. People have to take precautions. What precautions? Well, really, we're just saying to people to stay safe. Don't put yourself in a position where you may be attacked. Be very aware of your surroundings. Go out with friends if you've got to go out. Be very careful. Just don't put yourself on offer. If you've seen anybody who you think is suspicious, particularly if you see someone hiding as this guy was, for heaven's sake, call us here in the studio. If there's a member of your family, a friend has be been behaving oddly, if you are a psychiatrist or part of the psychiatric community, call us in the studio if there's anyone you think the police ought to know about. The number is always on the bottom of the screen, 0500 600 600, or call the incident room on 020 8358 0100. You can also email us, just go to our website at bbc.co.uk forward slash crime. Now, here from Sussex Police, it's Detective Chief Superintendent Jeremy Payne. It's reckoning in the last year up to a million new security cameras have been installed in the UK, and sometimes they catch the crooks right in the act. Take a look at these and see if you recognise anybody. We start with an attack by this man last month at Malden Manor Railway Station near Kingston in Surrey. At the booking office, he tells the clerk that one of the ticket machines is broken. The clerk comes out to have a look, but is pushed back into the room. The attacker forces him to open the safe, ties and gags him with bandages and steals cash. If you can, tell us who he is. To Swindon now and a series of burglaries carried out last spring. In this one, the offender goes into the back room of a grocery store and helps himself to cash, cigarettes and phone cards. Meanwhile, his accomplice distracts the staff. Another day, another store and more cigarettes, this time straight over the counter. We believe these two men were in both shops at the time of the burglaries. We'd very much like to speak to them. Finally, to a bank in Ely, Cambridgeshire, last June. 
a man makes two cash withdrawals. Unfortunately, the money wasn't his to withdraw. This man, dressed all in black, was in the bank at the time, and we'd like to talk to him. Does he look familiar to you? If you can help, call us here in the studio, 0500 600 600. We had some great calls from last month's Crime Watch. Look what can happen when you just pick up the phone. First, our last programme's reconstruction of a string of sex attacks in south-east London, where a man climbed into women's rooms through upper-floor windows. Several viewers gave names, but one in particular led to an arrest. A man's been charged with five counts of sexual assault, one of attempted rape and five burglaries. Another direct result from our last programme. John Stanley's an HGV driver who could also be anywhere tonight. In fact, he was working in a pub in Plymouth. One colleague called the studio while another rang Devon and Cornwall police. He was arrested an hour after we came off the air and is now awaiting trial on 11 charges of indecency to children. In December, we showed the near-fatal stabbing of a 15-year-old on a bus in Brockley in South London. Four people have been arrested as a direct result of the reconstruction and are awaiting ID parades. Another Crime Watch viewer has doubled the reward to a total of £10,000. Patrick Porter was wanted in connection with two stabbings. We featured him last summer. Last month, he was discovered on the Isle of Man, independently of Crime Watch. He's awaiting trial, accused of GBH. Last July, we reconstructed an attack on a train in Victoria Station, London, in which a man was blinded. One caller thought she recognised the two people shown on CCTV. She called Crime Stoppers, and two men have been charged with GBH. They'll go to trial next month. The murder of an American artist jogging through a London park was bound to make big news, and last month's death of Margaret Muller continues to cause headlines. On Monday, police are going to be gathering hundreds or so people together who were there at the time in Victoria Park in Hackney. If you were in the park there at about 8.30 on that Monday morning, that's three weeks ago, Monday the 3rd of February, the police would very much like you to be there too. Please attend. They're still looking for a man who was seen jogging alongside Margaret that morning. Was he a friend or did he accost her? And they've yet to trace this man. He was one of two Mediterranean-looking people seen running out of the park. They may be important witnesses. Could this be you or somebody you know? Call our number, please. Margaret's killer may be a threat to others. Let me just tell you, we're getting so many calls in on the Marshall McDonald case already, and uh, one of the bus companies has rung in offering a, a reward of £5,000. Getting a lot of calls in. We'll update you as they come in. Uh, we featured con men knocking on people's doors before, but detectives here have never seen anything like this, and neither have we. A man and two women posing as social workers to take photographs of a naked toddler. Our reconstruction takes place in Oxfordshire. We've changed the victims' names. I moved to this house a year ago, basically because I split from the son's father. Yeah. Yep, my son's two and a half. Lives playing, watching telly into the tweenies. Got a monster. But, uh, Lovely little boy. And then this one? That goes in there. That's it, up a bit. There. And the last one? I wonder who that could be. Do you think it's Grandma? I wasn't expecting anyone to call, so I was a bit shocked when someone did knock at the door, especially saying who they were. Hello, are you Jane Bowman? Yes. We're from Social Services. Are you the mother of Jason Parsons? When my son was born, he took his father's surname. So when we split, and I never thought about changing it, just kept it going. Because I, I didn't disbelieve them. They had ID. I was just letting them in to prove that I hadn't done anything. Is Jason Parsons in the house now? Yes. What's this about? We've received a complaint about you and Jason. What? I'm afraid we've been told that Jason is being sexually abused. What? Who said that? I can't tell you that. It was a man, but I can't tell you any more. I shouldn't even really have told you that. The first thing that went through my head was it was my son's father, because we would 
going through a bit of a rough patch arguing and everything at the time. So I thought it was him trying to get at me in some way by putting me to social services. But it ended up not being that. There are one or two checks we need to do. I'll have to wait for the nurse to carry out Jason's examination. Nurse? She should be here soon. I'll have to look around the house and look for evidence. That's OK. It's all right. I'll go. I'll be the nurse. I was just interested in letting them do what they wanted to do to prove that I hadn't done anything. All I was trying to do is prove my innocence and protect my son to the best of my ability I could. Sorry. Sorry. I'm so sorry I'm late. The traffic was murder. It's OK. We've only just got here ourselves. I'm sorry. They looked professional. They looked... They knew what they were doing. And at the time, I didn't think of any reason to disbelieve what they were saying. So, they were good. Right, we can make a start. Could you undress him, please? Oh, on the slide. I really do think it would be better if you left the room. No, I'd rather stay with my son. He's really upset. It's OK, it's just quite natural to be upset. Right. The nurse, she examined my son. She took swabs from inside his mouth and other parts of his body. Just, uh, the gentleman took some photographs of my son, uh, naked. OK. And turn him around. He said they need them to examine them later on, just to make sure there was no hidden bruising or something that they had missed. The man had a wander around the house, looked in drawers, looked at things, looked at photographs. What's this? It's the photo of my son in the bath. It's a bit revealing, isn't it? Everyone has photos of their kids in the bath. Better take them. Film two. Any of him on this? Yeah, some, I think. Better take that too. We'll be in touch. They were very relaxed, uh, as if they knew what they're doing. They'd done it before. They made me feel like they were at home. So they knew what they were doing. They knew exactly how they were going to say things. It's like they had it all planned out. It's hard to believe how cool and convincing those people were. But after they'd gone, the mother told the neighbour, who thought it sounded suspicious, social services rarely turn up unannounced. Where the mother checked, social services knew nothing about it. With me now is Detective Inspector Andrew Boyd of Thames Valley Police. So, Andrew, how can people help tonight? Fiona, this offence happened in the Berensfield area of Oxfordshire, and uh, we're particularly anxious to hear from anybody in the Oxfordshire area who believes these people, these people may have visited them at their home address trying to gain access to their children. Do you think, do you think they're local, these people? I'm afraid We believe these people are local to the Oxfordshire area. However, we are aware that there are a number of similar other incidents across the country. Um, what we would do is urge people that believe they may have been subjected to similar circumstances to contact their local police. Yeah. We've got EFIDs of all three of them. First of all, the woman who was pretending to be a social worker. What, what can you tell us about her? She's slim. Um, she's aged about 40 years old. She's got blonde, collar-length hair, but it's her height that's particularly distinctive with her, six foot tall. Yeah, so she'd stand out, six foot? Yes, we believe so. And then the man, the man who he was also pretending to be a social worker? He was, again, approximately 40 years old. He's about five foot ten tall. He's stocky build. He's um, described as having a very distinctive square jaw. And then the nurse turned up. Um, what can you tell us about her? Um, she is around 30 years old. She's got brown hair. But it's particularly long, and on the day in question was told in a ponytail that actually reached the base of her back. So it was a bit longer than we showed in the reconstruction. Yes, it was. Actually, her uniform, it, it seemed to be genuine as far as the woman in the house could tell. It was believed to be a very authentic nurse's uniform. She had a breast watch and a nurse's style belt with an interlocking buckle. And one thing, of course, we haven't mentioned is, is that, that the social workers came in a, in a blue Ford Mondeo. They, we haven't actually got the registration yeah. for that. That's correct. We're particularly anxious to find anybody who may have seen the nurse either going to or coming from the vehicle that we believe may have been parked around the corner. Now, if 
People watching this may think, if someone turns up at my door and wants to see my children, how am I going to know that they're genuine as opposed to, to people like me? Yes. Social services will very rarely call at home address unannounced. Um, they're particularly anxious to explain to people that should somebody purport to be a social worker, they will always have an identity card which should be examined thoroughly. If there's any question at all, please contact the local social, social services office um, who will check those details for you. Social services will never ever examine a child in the home address. Any such examination will take place at a hospital or other appropriate premises and will always be conducted by a qualified paediatrician. And the fact is they can't, they can't come and take your child either, can they? No social services can't do that. Uh, they would never take a child unless they had a court order. Okay, well, this has happened to you and you haven't already reported it to the police. If you recognise the EFIT, or if you think you know who's involved in this, ring us now. For further advice on what to do if you do get a call like this, you can go to our website, www.bbc.co.uk slash crime. Next, a result. What you're about to see is taken from an interview with a prisoner who was named by 10 Crime Watch viewers. An actor plays his part. The victim is for real. Please, can you state your full name? Michael John Carr. You said initially you were at Ravenscourt Park Tube Station. What had you gone there for that evening? To mug someone. It was 18 months back when we showed this reconstruction. I got the train back from New Malden, and I was walking up the road to my house. And about halfway up, I could hear footsteps. I just, I just want you to know that I, I'm not going to hurt you. As, as he kept reassuring me, I just think, please go away, you know. But still, you think, you know, a minute from home, what's going to happen? Do you remember physically assaulting her at any point? I was saying to my solicitor, I can't remember. I was in vodka, whiskey, crack cocaine, Valium, a load of Valium. I dragged her. I brought her over across the road, into the park. How did you know an exit was open? I didn't, until I looked and I seen it was open. Michael Carr beat her, raped her, and held her captive in the park for three hours. After that, he led her by the hand out into a shopping street. She saw her chance and fled into a store. One of the things he said to me before we got into King Street was, don't tell the police because Crime Watch doesn't work. I couldn't eat for three days because I couldn't move my mouth. It was so badly bruised, I just couldn't physically open my jaw properly. And I was bruised and, and battered for a couple of weeks after it. Once you were back in your flat, what was your state of mind like then? I fell asleep. I think the most terrifying thing is what didn't happen. The thought of what actually, how close I nearly came to being killed. Although he had a shambling gait and a rather kind of dishevelled appearance, he's not a down and out as far as you can tell. Not at all. I was at Crime Watch late that night, um, still receiving phone calls, and I contacted the incident room back at uh, my police station, and I spoke to the office manager there, who sounded quite elated. OK, yeah, thanks very much. Thank you. This name's coming three or four times. Several uh, people had contacted uh, the incident room and uh, were positive that the man in the CCTV footage was, in, was indeed Michael Carr. I suppose I didn't believe that it would work, just because it just seemed such a long shot that someone would be watching the programme that evening, but to find so many people had recognised him and had actually bothered to call in. It was, it was amazing, it really was. We did some very quick research that night, and he fitted the criteria that we were, we were looking for. Um, his, his sort of background, where he was from, um, his accent, um, and the way he looked indeed. We can now reveal that one of the Crime Watch callers was a friend he'd visited the day after the attack. I, I did this terrible thing. Is that blood in your arm? Yes, it's the girl. I wouldn't want to read the girl. I've got you, kids. This thing is going to get me years. Will you cut it off? All right, Mick. You're making all this up, aren't you? As so often on Crime Watch, it was only when his friend saw the reconstruction that she realised the horror of what Michael Carr had done. Three days after the rape, having cut his hair and shaved his moustache, Michael Carr left London. At this point, um, we attended Victoria Station, uh, 
uh, where we viewed the uh, CCTV footage um, and identified Michael Carr actually purchasing a ticket to Ballinasloe um, in County Galway, which is where he originates from. Detectives contacted the Garda in County Galway and discovered Michael Carr had been arrested soon after arriving there for theft and assault at a hotel and was now in jail. They had to wait 19 months till he'd completed his sentence. Five weeks ago, he was extradited back to Britain. Michael, there are six extradition warrants outstanding against you that you're fully aware of. They relate to the offences of rape, indecent assault, actual bodily harm and false imprisonment. Michael Carr is due to be sentenced in two days' time. Coming up, a stash of antiques. Are any of them yours? And on patrol with the flying squad during a jewellery raid. All wearing masks. Uh, one of them's believed to have a firearm. This boy got his phone, look. Not even looking. And here's DCS Jeremy Payne again with more cases that need your help. Have you seen John Birtle? The Metropolitan Police have charged him with kidnap and fraud after an 81-year-old man was allegedly conned out of £45,000 worth of savings. John Birtle didn't turn up at court and the victim has since died. Birtle's a gypsy and we believe he may be in the area of either Blackpool or Leicestershire. And West Midlands Police are keen to find Murdad Yazdani, an Iranian who disappeared in September last year whilst awaiting trial in Birmingham on charges of a sexual nature. We know he worked as a labourer in nearby Redditch when he was arrested. He may be back working on sites now, either in the Midlands or possibly in Middlesex, where he used to live. Have you seen him? And Shahid Mohammed was arrested on the day a house in Huddersfield was firebombed. Eight people died, including five sisters between the ages of six months and 13 years. He was let out on bail, but we've not been able to find him since. Shahid Mohammed has contacts in Birmingham, Leicester, London and Pakistan, and we're very anxious to find him. Can you help? And finally, this man, James Bulger. Absolutely no connection with the little boy who was murdered 10 years ago. This James Bulger is nicknamed Whitey. He's a United States citizen and he's been on the run for the past seven years. There's a massive hunt underway to find him on both sides of the Atlantic. FBI agents think he may now be in London. Let me tell you a little bit more about this Whitey Bulger guy. He is uh, literally one of America's most wanted. The two agents here are from Boston, Massachusetts. They've flown over for Crime Watch for this appeal. You'll find Bulger on the FBI's website, directly under Osama bin Laden. Whitey is described as one of America's most notorious gangsters. And if you see him, well, as we've been saying, there is a reward of one million dollars. Lance Emery is head of the FBI's uh, investigation team here in London. Lance, what's all the fuss about? What's he wanted for? Mr. Bulger is wanted for a series of racketeering charges which include murder, conspiracy to murder, extortion, money laundering, and light charges. And how many offenses? How many murders, for example? Actually, he's complicit in 19 homicides. Hmm. And this picture, how old is the picture? Unfortunately, that picture is about nine years old. So how old is he? He's 73. 73. And this is what? Uh, this is an aged picture this or is this would, a real one? Yes, this would be an aged photograph with facial hair, as he may look today. But of course, we don't know if he's got a, a moustache or beard or whether he's dyed his hair or no, shaved it off or whatever. But there's a million dollars if someone can find out. Um, fit? I mean, what's he like as a 73-year-old? Well, he tries to keep fit, but he suffers from hypertension. And he may be taking uh, hypertension medicine, Amitol, to control his problem. He also requires glasses and contact lenses. Okay, so he might have been seen by an optician, by a doctor, somebody like that. Uh, he looks a nice enough guy. I mean, what's he like in terms of personality? Obviously, there are times when he's not nice. Well, he can be very charming. Uh, he's articulate, ingratiating, but he's a career criminal, and he normally always carries a knife on his person. Uh, I mean, he is dangerous to, to approach. He's very dangerous. Um, presumably, at 73, he's retired. Um, what's he doing? And what's he doing in the UK, do you think? Why is he here? Why do you think he's here? Well, we think he's here because we've had a sighting in the Piccadilly area last fall, as well as we discovered, with the help of the Metropolitan Police, uh, safety deposit boxes here and ultimately another safety deposit box in Dublin. Now, he used to have a girlfriend, I know. Will she be with him? Yes, possibly. A uh, girlfriend of Catherine Gregg. She's uh, known him for over 20 years. She's 5'7 uh, and about uh, 130 pounds. She's blonde-haired and blue-eyed. Now, 
What would he be up to? What are his interests? What's he going to be spending his time doing? Well, he's he likes animals. He's kept dogs before, so I would think he may have he may find some affinity with dog owners. Uh, he's an avid reader, uh, history in particular, the World War II period. He collects coins, and I would suspect with his interest of Boston that he goes into internet cafes and checks on the news in Boston on a regular basis. Okay, would he use his own name or is he somebody who habitually uses uh, aliases? Highly unlikely. He's used uh, several names. Uh, Baxter comes to mind, Marshall, uh, Shapton, several names to disguise himself. Okay, well, uh, he is very, very dangerous. So with 19 murders, uh, hardly you need me to tell you that. Call us if you have seen him. Keep an eye out for him. And for Catherine Gregg. And as I say, there's that little uh, incentive of $1 million as a reward, 0500 600 600. And let me just tell you about the calls we've had coming in so far. As we thought, a lot of calls on the Marsha McDonald murder. A few names have been given. Uh, a lot of callers talking about similar attacks in the same area. Uh, someone who lives very close to the most recent attack on the boy uh, rang and said he saw two people in hoods in the same area acting suspiciously a couple of weeks ago. And then just a, a couple of minutes ago, a woman has rung in saying that she also saw two young men in hoods acting suspiciously in that area last week. Um, one other thing, the Swindon distraction burglaries, a police officer's rung in with a name. Uh, we're going to be following that up as soon as we can. Keep those calls coming in. The studio number is on the screen. And if you're watching on digital satellite TV, you can email us directly through your remote control. Just press the red button on your handset and choose Connect. These are the officers on our next appeal. They're based in the Chelmsley Wood, south of Birmingham. Tonight, someone in Chelmsley Wood is going to be very, very worried. And some of his mates will know it. Who will be the first to tell us who he is? Six weeks ago, a father of two, David Warrillow, went into his local newsagent. Twelve seconds later, he was dead. Well, David is married to Tracy. Uh, they've been uh, together for 22 years. They've had two children. One's Faye, which is 14, and Chad, and he's 12. Is it injury? Uh, yeah, I think so. He's a very strong uh, Villa fan. He lived for Aston Villa. He used to go every week. He worked for Midland Welding on the Birmingham Business Park. They put him on the road as a delivery person. He used to get up roughly about six o'clock. He used to come out there around about half past six, up to the grove where he used to park the van, get in the van, round the corner, into the paper shop, get his paper from there straight to his firm, load up and then out on his deliveries. Monday to Friday, that was his routine. David almost certainly knew he shouldn't leave his keys in the ignition, but he was only going for a few seconds. It was all part of his routine. But while he was inside, someone took their chance. Cheers. Bye. Oi! What are you doing? That's my phone! Get out! Get out! What's your problem? Come on! But watch again as the van sped off. A Volvo drove off too. That driver was either a witness or an accomplice. The van was then abandoned round the corner on Winchester Drive. Shortly afterwards, an anonymous 999 call was made from a nearby phone box. This is the recording. Ambulance emergency. We have an ambulance. The Willow Close, Jamsey Wood, please. 
Is there a house we're going to? No, uh, there's a man lying in the road. I just sent him get one over. Could you send one quickly? I'm going to go back and see if he's okay. Where are you phoning from? Phoning from the phone box right in the corner. Willow Close, Tom's the Woods, please, because. Yeah. Call yeah. the ambulance. Have you got a blanket or anything? Yeah, yeah, I've got something inside. Hello? I'll just go and get it. Yeah, ambulance, please. Yeah, a guy's been knocked over, I think. He's in the road. There's blood coming from his head and everything. Found him in the middle of the road. I don't know what's happened. There's blood everywhere, mate. Just came out of the shop. There's blood coming back. He was actually uh, put to rest in all his villa gear, villa t-shirt, a villa scarf with wrap round him. Everybody's dressed in uh, villa shirts, and uh, even his flowers was clad up in blue. Uh, but all the way through that service, I could see Dave lying there and hatred in me uh, for the person who's done, done this. You know, of a person who can mow down somebody and not stop. Uh, to me, he's not a person, he's an animal. But at least there are some cracking clues on who was involved and who might have seen them. Five minutes before the killing, someone was seen circling a white Vauxhall Astra outside the newsagent. Was this an innocent resident or the killer? Is that Volvo 480 that drove off at about the same time as the stolen van. Then these two men dressed in white, they may have seen something crucial. They were at the newsagent a couple of minutes before David got there. One bought something inside, his friend waited outside smoking a cigarette. Now they are not suspects, but they could be important witnesses. Who are they? And then there's that voice. Who made the anonymous 999 Hello, call? Have an ambulance. Close, Wood, Is there a house uh, we're coming to? No, uh, there's a man lying in the road. I just sent him get run over. Could you send one quickly? I'm going to go back and see if he's okay. Where are you phoning from? Phoning from the phone box right in the corner. Willow Close, Tom's the Wood, please, Chris. Yes. Yeah. Recognise that voice? Then there's a clue that we haven't got. It's this. The keys to David's van have still not been recovered. They were on a fob like this, a max power key fob. Now, we know there are thousands of these around the country. It's only if, in some way, you can have found one of these in the area or can match this somehow to the crime. Now, here with his team, Detective Chief Inspector Andrew Shipman, I think, Andrew, you, you think that news of this will have spread far and wide and that he himself will have told a lot of people. Yes, I'm certain that uh, the person responsible went out that morning intending to steal a, a car, not to kill David. And I'm pretty certain that will be weighing on his conscience now. And he may well have talked to family and friends about this, portraying the incident as, uh, as an accident. And I really urge the family and friends to, to encourage him to come forward to us so we can uh, deal with this matter. Of course, if he's maintaining it was an accident, there's no reason why he shouldn't uh, come forward. And, and obviously family and friends should very, very much push him towards that because if he doesn't, obviously things look much, much worse for him. What about people who've heard on the grapevine who he is? Well, anybody who's got any information at all should, should get in touch with us at the incident room. Quite clearly, we know who the person who made the call had a conscience and I hope that the person responsible has a conscience and, and wants to come forward and tell us about this okay. incident. Call us here in the studio, uh, or you can call the incident room, that's on 0121 712 6198. And time for you now to see if you can recognise, not some faces, but some antiques. Now, these have been recovered by police in Devon. Take a look and see if any of them are yours. This is Paul Hayes, he's an expert on antiques. So Paul, what have we got here? We have some fantastic items. And one of the most, most ostentatious, if you like, is this bracket clock. And it was designed originally to hang on the wall on a bracket. And this dates from Europe, probably from the uh, end of the last century. Uh, it has these wonderful panels here at the side where you can actually hear the chime. And if you look at this little dial on the front, you can turn the chime on or off, depending on how annoyed you got with it, really. <laughs> and if someone wants to, to ring in and claim this, how are they going to be able to prove you know, that it really is there? All right, well, this is quite clearly on the back of the movements. It has a maker's name, so that's what we're going to look for. A set of initials on the back there that will tell people whether it's their clock or not. All right, and what about this one? This is beautifully ornate, this. Well, this is French, what they call ormolu, which is gilded bronze. Uh, typical of what was going on in the late 19th century. Uh, very standard movements, but the emphasis were on these wonderful cases. This has a serves inlaid panel, porcelain, hand-painted, Absolutely fabulous and very decorative on that one. 
All right, now we've got a whole uh, array of, of beautiful jewellery over here. I was wondering when your eyes would go. Yeah, <laughs> I've never seen anything like it. I have to say my eye was drawn to this <laughs> amazing item. Absolutely fabulous. This is an Art Deco 1930s ladies cocktail watch. Wonderfully encrusted with diamonds. We've got old cut diamonds in the middle there, and rose cut. And typically what a lady would have in the 1930s when she was entertaining and a, a real gem item, really. And how much would something like this be worth? Uh, that would actually stand you about £40,000. <laughs> well, put it back. And, and how would you be able to identify that if you wanted to claim that? Well, on the clasp, there's a very clear maker's initial. So that's what we're going to look for. A set of initials on there which, which would only say that's your item. And what about this decanter? This is beautiful. Well, it's a decanter box or a tantalus, which is a used tantalus. to... A tantalus? yeah. Never heard of uh, it. Greek mythology. Uh, there was a guy called Tantalus who was punished by the gods and basically they submerged him in water up to his neck and he couldn't take a drink, so he's tantalised He was tantalised, right. So when you saw these on the sideboards, you knew what was in them, but you couldn't quite get in them because they're all locked away. Uh, this is Calamander wood. Um, it dates from about 1840 and it has quite clearly a retailer's mark on the, the brass uh, lock at the front. So you'll be able to, to claim that if that's yours. Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, there's around 40 items here, so if these fine things are yours, or if you recognise any of the stuff uh, behind us here, pick up the phone and claim it. The police will then ask you details about the item, as we were saying there, so, that, so we'll know if the call is genuine. Next, not a reconstruction, but instead Crime Watch cameras went with the police as they answered a 999 call. It's a unit from the Flying Squad, which has uh, 136 detectives and focuses uh, entirely on armed robberies. It has a pretty formidable record. A third of all its cases result in prosecutions, and 90% of those lead to convictions. The Flying Squad image from the public's eyes is obviously the Sweeney, John Thor, Jack Regan, you know, with the Sweeney we have our breakfast. Um, there's, there's that, and then there's the, the, modern, the modern Sweeney. Flying Squad. The primary response is a 999 call. That goes to Scotland Yard. Then Scotland Yard notify each office. There's four offices and each one covers a quarter of London. Yankee Echo from Central 900. The robbery at uh, the jewellers, Facets Jewellers. Just to let you know, Central 922 will be attending. This is called the bank car. Unmarked with an expert driver plus two more detectives. They're called out after uniformed officers have already attended the scene, so it's not a frantic rush, but they want to get there before the trail goes cold. It's being robbed by possibly six persons, all made up on foot, all wearing masks. Uh, one of them's believed to have a firearm. That's as much information as we've got. Oh, I've got his phone, look. Not even looking. Just look now. Sorry about the DC battery from the flying squad, DC yeah. Dicks. What have you got? We've got one IC1, he's pressed the buzzer, and there's about four or five IC3s have stormed down past him. It's, yep. One of them has threatened that he's got a gun, it's, he's had a grey plastic bag. It's not been seen at this time, it's just been threatened. Yeah, uh, sure. And then we'll get the statements off these two people. All this stuff on the floor, they're just, just, just falling out as they put the trays. Yeah, out of the trays and all stuff, just keep it back in. All right. They take anything from the back? But, yeah, that's right. When you was out the back? Yes, yeah, gold out there, it's a bag of money there. Were they expecting money to be here, do you think? Or they just asked for money? They never asked for money? No. Okay. All right. And the bloke sort of pointed the bag at you? Yeah, there was another bloke behind him, I think. Yeah. I just heard a smash. I couldn't see nothing happening because I was facing this way. Yeah. The man with the gun saying more to you? Stay there, so he kept saying, he kept moving, I'll shoot you. That was what his words were. Carrier bag was grey, yeah? Yeah, like a hospital bag. I mean, at the end of it, it looked like a gun. Yeah. Yeah. You don't know, mate. You don't know what's in it, do you? No, that's right. Hopefully, from inside the mail, there's some CCTV footage. There's no CCTV from inside the shop. They were just changing the tape. It happens, doesn't it? It happens. There was, uh, they were sick about it as we are, really. But, and it would have been a good picture for a change. We've got the fingerprint man here. See what uh, the fingerprint man can do. Let the photographer take the photos, and then we'll be leaving. Go back to your office and view the CCTV. It's painstaking because, as you can see, we've got to go through each frame of each camera angle. We've got a couple of stills of the youth that was out the front just prior to the door opening. We've got pushed out of the way when the rest ran in. Not a bad start, is it? Looks like the, the youth that went out the back with the carrier bag. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fine. See if it goes in. This is on the way in. First sightings are here. We should be send it to the local police stations. Maybe some of the local officers, local knowledge, that'll help us out. See how we go from there. Take a good look. Here are three out of those four robbers. The robbery took place at the North Mall in Edmonton in North London, and the thieves may very well be local. 
if you know them, if you think you do, or if you saw them on the morning of Monday of last week. 0500 600 600. Let me just tell you about this call that we've just had in. Do you remember we showed you the case of those bogus social workers who were trying to get in to take indecent photographs of toddlers? A lady's rung in saying she believes a lady with glasses, that was one of the social workers who was six foot tall, if you remember, so very distinctive. She believes she called at my house asking to see my grandson last week, saying she was a child psychologist. She asked if she could see him play. So she's left her name and her number. The police will obviously follow that up. We've had some superb results on cases where viewers were able to help. Proof that your call really does count. In March last year, two men abducted a woman at the National Exhibition Centre, just south of Birmingham. I thought I was going to die, but if I was going to die, I wasn't going to go quietly. Keep going! Keep going! There's an apparat on Ernton High Street! I can hardly breathe! Um, I need to cash my company cheque. My main concern was to get the transaction done without anybody panicking behind the screens. We need some change. Change for the bus. This is all I've got. Come on. I couldn't believe they had the audacity and the cheek to actually ask me for change so they could go home. You know, that company check was only for £200. Who are they? A viewer recognised the efits of the two men and went straight to their local police with names. Spencer Price was convicted of kidnap and robbery and sentenced to six years in prison. And another man who's pleaded guilty to the same is awaiting sentencing. Last year, we showed disturbing footage of an unprovoked attack on a couple outside Kidbrook Station in East London. I was just in a three-point turn, and as I came and brought the car around, um, three boys crossed the front of the car. So I got out of the car, and uh, he just went for me. The violence seemed to be for fun, and many Crime Watch viewers were appalled. On the night, two callers named two men. One was Stephen Bett. Police arrested him. He was sentenced to two years. The second name was Sean Clark, and he was tracked down while working at a local supermarket. He admitted GBH and is awaiting sentencing. You think, uh, well, nobody's going to come forward, but it's very important that people take notice of things, and then they go to the phone and say, yes, I can help and I'll give this important information. In May 2001, we showed two men about to burgle some elderly accommodation in Braintree, Essex. They weren't known to local police, but an off-duty officer in North London was watching the programme and knew them well. He told us they were Patrick and Martin Corley. For a time, neither could be found, but earlier this month, Patrick was sentenced to 15 months and Martin to five years. I think the lines have been pretty much jammed. Apologies if you've been trying to get through. Please uh, keep on going. Um, as Fiona was saying, on the bogus social workers, this seems to have been happening in all sorts of places up and down the country. Um, as far as Whitey Bulger is concerned, we've only had a handful of calls on that, which is intriguing given there's a million dollar reward. So perhaps he's not in the country, or perhaps people are just biding their time for that one. On the Swindon um, distraction burglar, we've got uh, at least two people, I think more now, uh, giving the same name for that one. Most of the calls tonight have been on the attacks in southwest London, uh, including the murder of Marshall McDonald. All of these are among the potential witnesses to the precursors of these attacks that have come in. We've had uh, 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 sightings of all sorts of interesting uh, things that have happened and a lot of calls from Witten and also from Croydon on this issue. Um, there's a lot more we'll be able to tell you later on that. All the numbers are on CFAX on page 621 if you want to keep calling. Don't forget you can see the details of all tonight's cases plus crime prevention tips on our website at bbc.co.uk forward slash crime. Our phone lines are open until midnight tonight and again this Thursday and Friday from 7.30 in the morning until midnight. We'll be back at 10.35 with a Crime Watch update. If that's after your bedtime, don't have nightmares. Sleep well. Good night. Good night.
congestion charge for or against it? Tell us on BBC London 90.